Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network. Um, and let me just fix the audio right now. Let's see. Um, and so welcome. And I'm filling in right now for Lauren Wenzel from the NOAA National MPA Center. Um, and this webinar is co-hosted by uh, the NOAA National MPA Center, MPA News, OpenChannels.org, as well as my organization, the EBM Tools Network. So we'd like to welcome you all today. And we'd especially like to welcome our presenters. Uh, we have Julie Randall and Adam Hansen from WILD. And to let you know a little bit about our presenters. Julie is Vice President for Programs at WILD. Uh, she leads the Marine Wilderness 10 plus 10 project and the Nature Strategy for Sustainability in Wild Cities program of the WILD Foundation. For the past five years, she served as facilitator of the North American, North American Intergovernment Mental Committee on Cooperation for Wilderness and Protected Areas Conservation, um, composed of the heads of the four U.S. land management agencies, Parks Canada, and the Mexican National Commission on Natural Protected Areas. Adam provides program support to the Marine Wilderness Project for the Wild Foundation. He has a Bachelor's of Science in, in Biological Sciences from South Dakota State University and is pursuing a Master's of Science in Biological Science at Old Dominion University. Uh, he was a Peace Corps volunteer specializing in coastal resource management and establish of marine tech protected areas. Um, before we Go any further, though, I'd like to let everyone know how to ask questions. So you can ask questions by typing into the question panel of the, your user interface. And feel free to send in questions throughout the webinar. Um, we'll, we'll only interrupt the presentation for clarifying questions, but uh, there will there'll be a long period for question and answer at the end of the presentation. And you can go ahead and send in questions throughout. So I welcome everyone, and I'll turn it over to Julie and Adam right now. Hi, well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining the webinar today. Um, we're going to be covering the topic of marine wilderness. Very exciting with the 50th um, anniversary of the Wilderness Act being celebrated this month and next. I think that's why uh, Lauren Wenzel had chosen this topic for the webinar this, this time. So this is my um, program assistant, Adam, is also on the line and will provide um, some support with answering some of the questions and help prepare this presentation today. Um, so just to give you a quick overview of what the presentation will cover, you can see that we're going to talk about the, what marine wilderness is as a concept and a conservation strategy, and, and then we're going to get to a project that we're undertaking to implement uh, marine wilderness as a conservation strategy. So marine wilderness, we consider it to be the most powerful vision of functioning healthy and resilient marine life and that we believe it best generates repopulations of wild species that are interconnected to form productive food webs. And among resources extracted from marine environments, wilderness is non-renewable, and at the current rate of its loss to us and future generations, it should be of top concern. And therefore, integrating people into conservation efforts of you know, conserving marine wilderness is critical to preserving it. Um, marine, for the purposes of um, this concept includes the water column, the seabed, the living and non-living resources that are contained therein. Um, it's located on the open ocean and in intertidal zones, estuaries, lagoons, large lakes, mangroves, kelp forests, seagrove meadows, coral reefs, and a number of other habitats that you can imagine being marine. Um, but in particular, uh, we focus on spawning and reproductive habitats um, and associated coastal areas, and include ice and land landfast ice edges. So as a conservation strategy, what we're intending to do is compare what wild nature looks like underwater and connected to land and how it functions when intact, and then compare that to places where wild nature has been damaged by humans and how its functioning is impaired. As you can see from this dramatic comparison in the photos on the screen. So marine wilderness also contributes to marine science in that it serves as a control group, a natural laboratory, and a baseline area for studying climate change and other human-induced impacts. Undisturbed wild ocean ecosystems um, 
also provide valuable reference conditions that allow scientific study of ecological functions and processes. As a concept, marine wilderness can apply at any scale. We consider it to be often associated with large areas that are pristine and proven generators of rapid bio fish biomass recovery. But small areas are also important to understand in the marine wilderness context. They're often small areas that are co-located with high human domination are often the coral reefs and mangroves that are critical to regenerating species, fish recovery, marine mammals, seabirds, and others. Often the idea that um, often when large marine wilderness areas are conserved, there's an impression that the job is done, but meanwhile the smaller areas that are often more coveted um, remain without protection. So part of our marine wilderness strategy is to focus also on unprotected places or places that need, need better enforcement where fisheries are collapsing, coral reefs are dying, and mangroves are being destroyed. So making the case for marine wilderness, we want to take an ecological, economic, and social approach. Ecologically, we aim to, you know, we believe that marine wilderness um, can nurture the recovery of species and we can, by targeting critical habitat, as marine wilderness also provides for resilience to human-induced impacts and accounts for the connectivity between inland, coastal, and marine areas. We want to keep in mind that marine wilderness is connected to land and what's, what's happening on land and human-induced impacts there as well. Economically, um, we believe that the value of marine ecosystems should be accounted for in the economy and that there's a, the cost to restore or replace marine ecosystem services would be greater, far greater than in, uh, investing to protect them. We recognize that poor communities in marine areas rely on marine wilderness for protein sources and for livelihoods. And there are also our, our macroeconomic scale arguments we can make regarding ocean fluidity and the fact that marine damage by one nation often impacts the ecosystem services of another. Socially, uh, marine wilderness is important to many indigenous people, but also to visitors and people far from the marine wilderness that may value it for its existence or for its legacy, the opportunity to protect these areas for future generations. Recreationists that get into the water or ride on top of the water, um, fishermen, recreational fishermen, surfers, divers, snorkelers, kayakers, and others really value the clean environment of a marine wilderness that also is teeming with wildlife. For some, marine wilderness can be key to experiential growth and, and spiritual enrichment, particularly um, the fact that it can be um, far from uh, built infrastructure. The history of marine wilderness and it, the conservation as a conservation strategy was really launched back in 1990. Uh, should be 85 um, World Wilderness Congress that um, it actually involved NOAA's Dr. Nancy Foster, and it was brought up there as a concept. But then um, didn't really evolve too much further. It was brought up again in 2004 at a law and policy roundtable that the Wild Foundation held in Washington, D.C., which actually involved Brad Barr from NOAA. Um, but then in 2008, um, the Wild Foundation and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's refuge system worked together to generate a first marine wilderness definition and management objectives draft that was presented at a workshop um, in D.C. that was hosted by what's now called the Marine Conservation Institute. Um, and there was some initial feedback um, there and then also, it was then taken to the Ninth World Wilderness Congress held in Merida, Mexico, and presented at a workshop there with a number of countries participating. It was a very popular workshop, really the, the most popular one at Wild Nine, we believe. Um, and then the concept was uh, taken on by the North American Wilderness and Protected Areas Committee, which I will get to the next slide. Um, at the same uh, World Wilderness Congress where we had the workshop on marine wilderness, the MOU um, on wilderness and protected areas conservation was signed by the agencies that you see there on the screen, but uh, by the agencies, 
the agency heads of uh, the Bureau of Land Management, the Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Forest Service, um, Park Service, Parks Canada, and then the, the Mexican National Commission on Natural Protected Areas. And they're all very happy to sign it, as you can see there. <laughs> um, that's uh, some. It, some of you may recognize people in the pictures, but there's John Jarvis, the director of Park Service, and Alan Latrell, the head of Parks Canada, Sam Hamilton, who has been director of Fish and Wildlife Service, and on and on. Um, NAPA, as it's the acronym for the um, committee, is called NAPA. And it established a marine wilderness working group that was chaired by Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the Mexican Natural Protected Areas Commission called uh, CONAP for short, and Parks Canada. And they took the draft definition and management objectives for marine wilderness that we had worked on with Fish and Wildlife Service and evolved it into the Conserving Marine Wilderness document that was ultimately adopted by the agency heads in November 2011. And this um, Conserving Marine Wilderness document, which is available on on the website, which is uh, just NAPACommittee.org. Um, it actually lays out a pretty um, thorough description of a definition and management objectives for marine wilderness for the first time. Um, whoops. Um, so the definition and management objectives um, aim to ensure that human activities um, in marine wilderness are sustainable or restorative and leave the environment unimpaired for future generations to enjoy and utilize. And that um, it focuses on intact ecological integrity and ecosystem processes, including um, ensuring uh, the avoidance of trophic downgrading and other um, biodiversity um, damage. So we want to so, so the idea um, with NAPA and the Conserving Marine Wilderness vision was to focus on conserving key reproduction areas and habitat that are critical to maintaining natural age and sex structures of, um, structures of species, the key foraging grounds, ecologically important geological and oceanographic habitat features, critical stopover habitat for migratory species, and to reduce the impact of invasive species. The key to making, um, to applying marine wilderness values and marine conservation is the marine wilderness management tool that would be customized to each um, marine site. It would look at the physical condition, history of use, species protection and recovery goals, habitat types, types, um, and it would depend a lot on the particular features of that area. You know the the. Uh, the social, economical, economic, and ecological features of that site. It's really modeled, um, the idea is to model it on the terrestrial wilderness management plans that U.S. agencies use. Um, so marine wilderness values are also inclusive of traditional wilderness-based lifestyles and customs. Um, we intend for marine wilderness to um, consider the input of local people in determining what constitutes act activities that don't leave lasting damage to wild nature. Obviously, marine wilderness can protect important um, sacred and ancestral um, sites and places important for ceremony and spiritual use, um, important to indigenous people. So by protecting marine wilderness, we can also protect um, some of the rights of local indigenous people to their marine, important marine um, heritage. So again, focusing around marine, uh, marine wilderness values as refugia, resilience, and recovery for marine life and biodiversity. Um, marine wilderness is considered or defined to be undeveloped with, without industrial activity, therefore rules out commercial fishing, but it does factor in traditional and artisanal fishing that can be managed through the wilderness plan and also allow for uh, recreational fishing that can be considered to have no lasting impact on um, reproductive and spawning and um, mating areas for fish and, that, and so forth, the lasting sort of impacts that could uh, damage marine wilderness. Marine wilderness is also considered to have a wild and natural appearance to the best <laughs> possibility. In some cases, um, marine wilderness may not 
you know, if it's on a coastal area, it may not um, be able to avoid views of buildings on the shore and that sort of thing. But the idea is that rain wilderness is considered to be to be natural in appearance. Um, that it would have, um, again, no built infrastructure within it. That there would be opportunities for personal renewal to really have a connection with with nature and. Um, the idea with wilderness um, experiences in general is that people can feel self-reliant and have some sense of solitude and, and get away from the pressures of, um, of developed um, urban areas and so forth. So there are opportunities to experience sort of what's considered appropriate recreation, um, where there's, there's opportunities for real physical and mental challenges, obviously, with like surfing, um, diving, and so forth. Um, wildlife viewing. Obviously, um, one thing that I'm sure will come up is that is the access um, to marine wilderness is likely to require um, some motorized access. And the idea is that motorized access would be managed through the customized marine wilderness plan. So it would depend on tides. It would depend on um, what the sensitivity is of the habitat of that marine wilderness. So. The Wild Foundation um, at the 10th World Wilderness Congress, which was last October in Salamanca, Spain, um, we had several workshops there. I had a whole uh, wild water program that we um, put on. There were six workshops and a round table, 54 presenters from 10 countries. Um, and we integrated conservation photography and filmmakers, as you can see there. Um, we had a wild water crossover day where we had um, National Geographic quality photographers, members of the International League of Conservation Photographers that we actually co-hosted this day with. Um, and as you can see, we have um, some the idea is to have practitioners, um, policymakers, and photographers um, and filmmakers um, sort of up on stage with um, to have a dialogue together. And out of this um, crossover day came the idea of doing a um, this Marine Wilderness 10 plus 10 project where we would combine um, management policy uh, practitioners and um, conservation photography into a single project. So really combining communications um, with the more typical conservation strategy of management and policy. So this is the launch and we have um, the first uh, step we took with the project was to hold a workshop um, that established a partnership of ten organizations that you can see there is represented by their logos. Um, the intention is that, that we would use the NAPA Marine Wilderness definition and management objectives to align all stakeholders, um, that uh, the most stakeholders we, we can, um, around this common um, definition and vision and understanding of what a marine wilderness is. Um, we don't aim to immediately legally designate um, marine wildernesses, although that would be a, a nice longer term goal. Um, but we do hope to um, develop stakeholder teams where we can use those stakeholders um, committed to this definition and management objectives um, for some decentralized enforcement of existing um, protections and establish some new protections. So the strategy um, sort of starts with looking at an area, um, really the EEZ, um, related to where we believe there's marine wilderness remaining um, and where some marine wilderness values could be restored. So we would uh, we would look at the whole entire sort of section of the EEZ and look at um, what are the existing MPAs and where they're working to protect marine wilderness qualities and emphasize that protection and enforcement of those protections. Look where there are local communities that have traditional rights of access and an opportunity to better protect um, their local marine wilderness. And then in some cases it may be possible to over time legally designate areas as a um, distinct type of MPA or even a zone within an, an existing MPA. And then we hope to someday be able to take the marine wilderness concept to the high seas and see where we can protect some areas um, that are um, really being pummeled by um, ungoverned practices. 
So really, again, we're trying to combine management enforcement tactics with communication tactics as, as a strategy going forward for marine wilderness. We want to get people to acknowledge that marine is, areas are in decline, but also give them hope and vision to expect better. So using this conservation photography, as you'll see demonstrated throughout this presentation, there's some really amazing photographers that we already have involved in contributing photos to our work. And we intend to make this vivid, um, show this vivid contrast between a um, very healthy teeming with wildlife, um, beautiful marine wilderness compared with deg degraded areas and show, hopefully show change over time to bring those areas back. So the partners in the project um, are, as you can see, they're the Wild Foundation Fish and Wildlife Service, a Healthy Reefs for Healthy People initiative, a Native American tribe called the Talala Dene, the Smith Ranch River Rancheria in Northern California that oversee one of the um, new sites under the California Marine Life Protection Act called uh, Pyramid Point, uh, Wild Coast, Costa Salvaje, that works in, um, in Southern California, um, across the border to uh, Baja California. Um, Natural Numbers, which is um, photographers and scientists working together to bring um, short, quippy, understandable data <laughs> messages, uh, using scientific data to develop um, powerful messages for policymakers to understand threats to a natural environment. So there's a lot of work particularly focused in Baja California. Sea Legacy is two amazing photographers um, that work for National Geographic, um, Christina Mittermeier and Paul Nicklin. Um, ILCP is the International League of Conservation Photographers, um, involving many National Geographic as well as other photographers that are very talented and, and committed to conservation. The Khalid bin Sultan Living Oceans Foundation, which does a lot of um, data, um, coral reef data collection around the world, um, and Jason Houston Photography, which he's a photographer that works very closely with, with us on our communications plan. So our project goal is to, is to achieve successful marine wilderness conservation in 20 sites around the world. The original idea was to have 10 sites that were idyllic marine wilderness and then compare those to damaged marine, 10 damaged marine wilderness areas, but then we decided together as partners not to um, sort of put down the 10 that were degraded um, and rather look at um, these 20 on a spectrum at any given time ranging from intact and ecologically functioning to impaired and then also looking at management from well managed to not managed at all. Um, and then use these sisterhood of sites um, really to support each other and when there's a threat to one the others will, as part of the project, will support um, through media attention and through best practices and so forth to work toward um, strong protections for this marine wilderness. Oops. So our objectives are for the project um, are to um, manage and enforce um, marine wilderness areas through stakeholder commitments using this common definition um, and management objectives of NAPA. Um, to use partners, um, the partner creativity and expertise and their resources, um, a lot of, most of our um, um, partners contribute um, particular methodologies that we aim to replicate in each site. Um, we want to develop, create site teams of stakeholders that actually have a common, there's a common structure that we're applying, you know, including scientists, NGOs, policymakers, local indigenous people, you know, fishing community, recreationists, um, and then that, that sort of template for the site team um, will be applied to each site and we'll recruit stakeholders, uh, representatives for those teams to ensure that we're um, having a real diverse set of input for each site. And then, so part of the toolkit that we'll supply to each site would be strategic action plans that, that include the Marine Wilderness Management Plan, a template that we're developing now, the Marine Wilderness Communications Plan, which involves um, conservation photography and film, as well as media outreach, um, contributed uh, uh, narrative from professional conservation writers, as well as uh, journalists that we hope to engage. And then a um, very important aspect to 
each site's action plan is how it will monitor, evaluate, and report on success, and trying to do reporting in such a way that we can make messages really um, simple yet hard-hitting um, so that policymakers and the public alike, as well as the local people that would be involved, um, really understand what's happening at these sites. Um, so again, since we're combining communications with management and policy, the idea is to um, make sure that each site has a, has a set of photography and film assets that are really compelling to be able to use um, for the communications side of um, things. So this was our um, Imperial Beach workshop. Um, I'm there sort of middle center off to the right. <laughs> um, but you can see we have um, Jim Kurth there from the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Chief of Refuges. We have Dr. Ezekiel Escura, a very renowned um, marine scientist, um, Octavio Berto, um, and a number of professional photographers are there, Wild Coast hosts. And um, many of these are part of our longer term, and Doug Yurick from Parks Canada. And many of them are, are from our long-term partnerships that we established there, as well as the local refuge. Um, and um, there in the suit <laughs> is, uh, is the uh, California, um, sorry, the, the uh, Baja California Secretary of the Environment who came to our workshop. So at this workshop, the partners, um, there was a lot of input um, on what sites would be um, ideal for this project, and the partners decided <laughs> on 20 sites, and then, as you can see here, and then two were added sort of since the workshop, um, knowing that, that at least uh, a couple will probably fall out when we go through the vetting process. Um, a couple, a number of sites were combined into um, large sites, it just made sense because they're sort of interconnected. Um, so you'll see that number 15 there, the Southern California Bite site, includes a number of different um, MPAs managed by our partners. Um, and just to note that the Ross Sea is our one sort of more high seas um, site. It's been um, called the last great marine wilderness, or the last wilderness in a marine area, although it's not. Um, it's just noted as a place that needs special attention. It needs to be called marine wilderness to help protect it. So these are, are the, the sort of the quick uh, snapshot of the location of our sites. There is a sort of heavy concentration in um, North America, the, the Pacific West Coast, um, as partly due to partner um, representation at the workshop and sites were chosen because we have partner involvement there and commitment to making this project work. There's certainly, you know, um, a great number of other sites that have potential for the future. So our, our steps over the summer have been to, to sort of vet the concept further with key partners, with, with um, California state officials, um, other NGO colleagues, um, work towards getting funding through private sources, um, develop a, a sort of meta plan for the project with our partners, and develop the, the templates that are, become part of the toolkit that our sites will use, site teams will use, and beginning to identify and recruit the site team members. One of the big tasks we have to start with is to map the sites, um, to look at, these are just some of the examples of things we would try to map. Um, we probably will focus on some iconic species, um, regarding the reproduction and habitat areas, because we can't map every area, but we do want to bring attention to some of the iconic species that um, are particularly important for making a case for marine wilderness among our stakeholders. Um, we also want to look at you know areas within the EEZ and potential marine wilderness um, that are important to indigenous communities for cultural reasons and also for artisanal livelihoods and really to look at the impact um, on them from external sources, whether it be commercial, legal commercial fishing or from illegal pirating and foreign sources of um, extract, I guess. So one of the, so after mapping, we're, or along with mapping, we're also doing site profiling. We're looking at um, sort of the geographical information, the location, and the, the um, various specs regarding um, the location, 
um, GIS coordinates and such, and also the existing and potential or proposed MPAs, and other um, restrictions, shipping lanes, things like that, looking at ecological attributes, um, where there's existing policy and enforcement of MPAs and the science behind some of the um, doing literature searches on the science that's been done on those sites, looking at where um, conservation photography has already um, been evolved and where we need to send missions, uh, photographic missions to those sites. Um, looking at the importance of the area to fishing and to hunting even. Um, and then who are, those, who are the stakeholders that should be involved in the site teams or should know about the and then begin capacity building. Um, and then actually um, trying to begin identifying members of the site team. So the site team composition, um, as I was mentioning before, sort of represents these stakeholder groups. And you'll note that we include um, philanthropists because we believe, well, that philanthropists are an important part. They're investors in marine conservation. And we believe through this project that the philanthropists can see their missions fulfilled. Um, but also, also have a say, though, in how their investments are um, carried out or how their investments can have impact. And um, just to note also, because I hadn't mentioned it before, that tourism entities are also important stakeholders, um, providing um, you know, access and experiences in the marine wildernesses. So again, um, important feature of, of our marine wilderness strategy is to focus on the inclusion of um, professional conservation photography and trying to, so starting by cataloging the photos and site-related writings that we already have contributed or need, would like to ask to contribute to give us some baseline site um, associated photography, some of which you've seen in this presentation. And then we'll continue outreach and hopefully um, raise funding to do photographic missions through ILCP primarily. Um, and then we also um, have been talking to some filmmakers about getting exposure to the project through their, the films that they're making. Um, so again, this idea to focus on iconic species that are in uh, sorry, endangered, threatened, keystone, or, or even invasive species um, as sort of bringing the attention to the marine wilderness area, sort of tugging at people's hearts. Um, we believe that <laughs> there are some land um, animals that relate to marine wilderness, such as the jaguar you see there and the mangrove in uh, Marismas Nacionales um, in Gulf of California. So our project timeline is to do these things in the first year, you know, pro profiling, mapping, doing assessments, baseline assessments, assembling site teams, educating, beginning to educate stakeholders, uh, vetting um, the marine site concept with the the management authorities that exist um, to try to achieve their buy-in, um, and then do the selection of the final 20 out of the sort of 22 or 23 that we have, um, and then keep working on the evolution of the strategic action plan for each site. In year two, we expect to do more stakeholder involvement and get the local level to sort of take the lead more is our aim, um, identify where policy actions might be needed, um, what type of media outreach and announcements we can do on a project level, um, sort of again bringing that sisterhood um, to bear on the, um, each site to support those sites. And then ultimately to hopefully align with some educational initiatives that already exist, doing um, virtual expeditions in classrooms and via the web and so forth to bring site um, information to the public. This is just a quick sort of snapshot of the steps that, we're, that we've taken, the launch, the, the activities that we're doing at this time, and then moving forward, what some of the actions are that are going to be taking place. Um, again, this is the important um, aspect of each site is to do monitoring, evaluation, and reporting. Again, this comparison of the sites across the spectrum, um, using each other really to compel um, them toward greater progress. Um, Again, our idea is to do education, hopefully, through this project using technology that we believe that this, particularly using the um, conservation photography, we can really have an impact. We began to have some conversations with groups like Fish Forever, um, 
uh, and fishwise thinking about how marine wilderness might be um, sort of marketed where it's being used to rebuild spe species that are important for consumers. So that's about the end of the presentation. Uh, I thought we'd end with this dramatic photo from Paul Nicklin, who's one of our great photographers. Um, and just uh, we'll open the, the time now to dialogue. OK, so thank, thank you. you, Julie. Um, so I just want to remind everyone to ask questions. You can type the questions into the question panel of the user interface. And uh, please go ahead and send in your questions now. Um, one question that come in, do you have a listing of existing congressionally designated wilderness areas in the US? <laughs> well, the, we were talking beforehand this was going to come up. Um, there, are, I'm sure that um, via internet research you could easily find a congressionally, there, there are no congressionally designated, quote, marine wilderness areas in the United States. There, there are um, designated marine, um, sorry, designated terrestrial areas that include marine within them. And we have started to um, research what those are. And so it might be that there's a, a tidal area that during part of the day it's land and part of the day it's underwater. And that's part of a um, designated wilderness. That's one example. Um, OK. And there was um, the questioner actually sent a comment. There is a congressionally designated marine wilderness area at Point Reyes that includes a quarter mile offshore. And then, yeah, so there, okay. Oh, and somebody else wrote in, there's a wilderness database at the University of Montana. Yeah, I'm sure through Ari. Yeah, we've, we've, um, we've been identifying those designated marine, marine areas that are included in terrestrial designations, um, working with our agency, federal agency partners. Um, okay. We've been, I guess, hesitant to, um, call too much attention to, or putting too much emphasis on trying to designate as the first step towards conserving marine wilderness because we frankly just feel like there's not enough time to go through the whole designation process while these areas are disappearing. So our project is really to focus on stakeholder involvement and protecting the areas through various means. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Um, let's see. Of comment and questions. I think this is a wonderful endeavor. I was curious how these marine wilderness areas might be policed. I can see that being an issue not only for the more remote locations, but even for the areas a little more close to home. I know that is an ongoing issue with the established MPA in North Bimini, Bahamas. Yeah, yeah, no, that's definitely enforcement is is going to be one of the trickiest aspects of implementing this project. Um, because it's, it's such a problem now for existing protected areas. But the idea is that with these stakeholder groups, we hope to bring you know, sort of peer pressure um, on local people, um, using um, media attention to raise the visibility of where enforcement um, is not taking place or needs to be improved, where there's piracy, that sort of thing. And um, getting even you know, local fishermen and recreationists and indigenous people involved in helping to identify where there's violations and need of better enforcement. Have eyes and ears out there through the project. OK, thank you, Julie. Um, let's see. Let me catch up. Um, and there's a quick question. Is the Leopold Institute involved in this project? Um, they're very aware of it. <laughs> Alan Watson was actually um, of, of the Leopold Institute it was actually on the Marine Wilderness uh, Working Group for NAFA and um, is actually invited um, me and, and a number of other people to um, participate in a Marine Wilderness session at the 50th um, anniversary of the Wilderness Act conference coming up in the middle of October. So that's, I think it's a time factor. I think he would love to be involved, but it's, it's more of a time factor. Okay. Great. For him. Yeah. Um, Another question, how are you addressing the desire to select places that are both important to marine life and are relatively non-impacted with, with the reality that many times what is relatively non-impacted um, is, is not as important to food chains of which humans are a part? Okay, um, I think I understand that question. Um, no, I, I think with probably... I don't know if I could say most of the areas, but I think the majority of areas are 
heavily impacted by human use already or are threatened with it or um, are in need of better understanding of what the human impacts are as related to the food chain or the, the, the human uh, need for food, I guess. So um, fish recovery, um, commercially important fish, fish species are part of our iconic species focus because we aim to bring um, the project to bear on those sites that um, are important for recovering commercially important fish. Did I answer the question? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what the question was trying to get at. Oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, well, Leila, if you want to follow up, I think <laughs> there could be more um, depth. Um, it's just sort of uh, how, how, how are you able to select um, the fact that um, places that are important for marine life and non-impacted, given that the places that are most places important to marine life are fairly heavily impacted. Um, so if, if Leela wants to follow up, I'll let her follow up. But thank you, Julie. Okay. Um, are you concerned that this media exposure will attract more people and heavier use to these areas than currently exists? Uh, might this have an unintended effect? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, but you know, there's there's so much impact now already in these these sites that we've chosen. I, I think for the most part, um, I you know I, I think the idea is that people would be attracted to the area to um, enjoy the marine wilderness values that are there, and that the customized uh, marine wilderness management plan would um, manage for um, additional visitation that might occur over time. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, how can I get involved in this project? Are there opportunities for collaboration? Um, absolutely. We're looking at a number, aside from the, the partnership of 10 that exists now, um, where partners um, are being, new, new partners are being identified. Um, and we're developing relationships with some other partners potentially that would, you know, supply complementary method, you know, methodologies that would be replicable at the sites or else supply um, say baseline data, um, you know, conservation photography, whatever the case might be. For example, one of the partners that we've been talking to is the Turtle Island Restoration Network. They're very focused on sea turtles and also focused on Costa Rica, but we just haven't got to the point where we've um, actually formalized a partnership with them. Um, but we're, we certainly welcome um, exploring those opportunities, and my contact information is there on the screen. Okay. Thank you, Julie. And another question. What is the relationship between your effort and marine spatial planning? Well, you know, I think it's just going to depend how um, spatial planning is being addressed in the, each region where there's a marine wilderness site. So I think, you know, in some, like in the Cook Islands, for example, they're probably going to be doing some marine spatial planning to sort out how that large, um, vast uh, marine protected area that's been um, sort of declared, how it's going to be sort of um, sussed out in terms of what the uses are going to be. So hope, what, what our idea is that getting marine wilderness sort of in there early <laughs> is that there would hopefully be marine wilderness areas that are, um, you know, included as one of the zones within that big MPA. Okay. All right. Thank you, Julie. And. Are there opportunities for the public to nominate a space or area to be in contention to become a marine wilderness designated area? And if so, what would the first step be? Yeah, well, that's another great question. You know, I, I think, think we're always, you know, I think sort of um, understanding what the marine wilderness concept is and then may, maybe making a case for why that site um, should be included among our sites is certainly we would, we would be very happy to learn of it. and. Um, you know, please, you know, have the opportunity to include it over time. Okay. Um, let's see. Is the map showing the MW sites in your website? No, and that, that's, that's a very good question, too. We have been hesitant to put the sites out um, on the internet, you know, through our website. I mean, they're, they're obviously available if you dig deep, but we just um, are trying to stay under the radar a bit until we get further along with the project. Um, 
just don't want to unnecessarily create headaches for ourselves before we even get going, just to be honest. <laughs> okay, since you're not yeah. honest. Okay. Um, let's see. Would sites in the Great Lakes or other large lakes ever be encompassed by this initiative? Yeah, you know, I really wanted to have a, a Great Lakes site. And in fact, we're working through a Wild Cities project with Chicago and Chicago Wilderness, which is a big consortium of local NGOs and government that are working together. And that includes um, uh, some you know, NGOs working on the Great Lakes. But um, yeah, so we'd like to definitely include them sort of in the second round if we could. Um, because uh, you know, there definitely are some really important issues there. I've I've already explored. So it's just there wasn't really a champion for the site that came to our workshop or that sort of um, surface, so to speak. If there had been, I think it would have made that cut. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully they'll be there next time. And yeah. let's see. Uh, who is gathering the biological inventory data or providing the physical characterizations for these sites? Yeah, well, we're just getting that going. Um, we, we are trying to do that through partnerships and through the scientists that we're already working with. Um, so it just depends on the site. So, for example, as I mentioned earlier, the Khalid bin Sultan Living Oceans Foundation has been doing data collection of Bahamas and um, in uh, Cook Islands, um, a number of other places. Um, so for each site, it just depends on, um, you know, whether our partners already done some baseline data collection there, and we would just use the, the partners' data, or whether we um, could work with another colleague to obtain it, or um, whether we're looking at have. There's a couple partners that we're looking at that do sort of a more um, broad scale. Um, some broad scale data assessment. Okay, thanks Julie. And uh, the last question that we have right now, and if, if anybody has any more, please go ahead and send them in. Um, are the sites in state territorial areas or national federal water, or both? And both, yeah. At, at, um, the Southern California site, which I go back up to that, um, for example, has state areas that are part of the California Marine Life Protection Act there, and the national refuges, and um, we hope also that, you know, ultimately we'll have the Channel Islands National Park and hopefully some marine sanctuaries um, that are in that area. Um, these are just, these, this sort of initial list of the people are the, uh, have to do with the partners that we've already talked to, so we felt comfortable including them. But, but yeah, I've, I've actually, um, we have to do more legwork in California, obviously, which has really gotten started. But, um, but yes, definitely the states have marine areas that will be hopefully um, involved. Okay. All right. Well, Julie and Adam, thank you so much for presenting today. Um, this is it's an incredibly interesting project, and we look forward to, to following it as it progresses. Um, if you guys have any last words, uh, when we'll we'll um, close up afterwards. And thank you yeah. everyone who attended. Yeah, Adam, do you want to say something? You have been very quiet. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I don't really have anything to add, but I appreciate everybody attending today. Thank you very much. I look forward to meeting some of you in the near future. Okay, well, thank you guys. Uh, thank you to, to Julie and Adam, and thank you to everyone presented, and we look forward to having you on a future webinar. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you so much.